Eric Haskins, Communications Director for the South Dakota Department of Health, and I'm joined by Kim Olson Risden, Secretary of Health, and Dr. Joshua Clayton, State Epidemiologist. Dr. Clayton will give us an update on today's cases, and then we will take your questions. All right. Good morning, everyone. So today we are reporting 82 new cases of COVID-19 in the state. This does include four new hospitalizations uh, and one new death. Uh, that death is among a Hughes County resident. Uh, we do have 85 newly recovered individuals and uh, a total of 1,637 new tests that have been reported to the Department of Health. In total, uh, we now have uh, 9,897 COVID-19 cases in the state. Uh, of those, one, uh, 1,058 of them are considered active infections, uh, and 8,691 individuals are considered recovered to the point where they are no longer able to transmit COVID-19. We have had, um, or excuse me, do have currently uh, 56 individuals who are hospitalized. Uh, and that does bring our total uh, uh, death count uh, up to 148 um, and, uh, in the state. And then uh, in total for tests, we've had 158,396 158, uh, total tests reported. Uh, that is among 124,770 unique persons. Um, and so uh, that information is now being updated to the website. For our cluster updates, I uh, just wanted to provide uh, what will be our last update on the Camp Judson uh, uh, cluster, and we had 90 individuals who have recovered out of 95 cases. Uh, we have um, uh, we don't follow up on out-of-state residents, but we have three uh, COVID-19 cases among 43 known uh, out-of-state campers, uh, and uh, a total of uh, zero hospitalizations. Uh, one of the things that I would like to um, just uh, expand on a little bit um, is that, you know, when we are looking at our younger population, um, so of those individuals who are aged 0 to 19 years, uh, we have had now 1,250 COVID-19 cases. Uh, we've only had 26 hospitalizations among all of those individuals, which means it's a 2% hospitalization rate for that younger age group. Now, this does compare uh, to the uh, 65 year of age and older population in the state that has uh, been identified as being COVID-19 cases. Uh, we have had 1,596 of those cases uh, and a total of 418 hospitalizations, which is a 26% hospitalization rate among those aged 60 years and older. Uh, the last uh, cluster update that I wanted to provide is that uh, we have uh, a Bethel Lutheran home uh, that has uh, now reached the threshold for reporting. Uh, we have had a total of 41 residents and staff that have tested positive for COVID-19, um, but uh, this is, is something that um, you know, uh, we have seen uh, uh, some cases over time, uh, which means that uh, in total about 31 of those 41 residents at this point have recovered. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the majority of those individuals uh, have uh, had infection and have cleared that infection uh, to the point where they're no longer able to transmit COVID-19. Um, the other thing that I wanted to provide um, is just an overview of our uh, deaths by uh, race. And so, uh, you know, the information that uh, we have in total is that for uh, the number of white deaths, uh, we have 89 individuals. Uh, for those that are uh, identified as a Native American or American Indian, uh, 37 individuals. Uh, we have uh, five uh, Asian deaths, uh, two among our uh, black population, and uh, 15 for other or unknown individuals. So. Um, that's where uh, there's either uh, uh, either a small number uh, or a group of people or um, some of those that uh, individuals decline to provide us uh, their race information. So with that, I'll go ahead and unmute our lines and we'll take your questions. We're ready for your questions. Yeah, yeah Ben with the uh, Plains, uh, Ben Chase with the Plainsman in Huron. Go ahead. Uh, yes, I 
talking with uh, Governor Noem yesterday, she mentioned that there would be some of the quick test units uh, provided for the state fair as part of an overarching plan that the Department of Health has with the state fair going on. And I'm just curious what that overarching plan, if you could give any more details on that right now. Uh, ben, this is Kim Olson Rison. So we are working with medical providers in the Huron community to determine if they are able to support the mass testing of residents um, in Huron after the state fair uh, to help, uh, you know, determine if uh, the level of COVID activity among people that are either working at the state fair or are working in businesses that help support, uh, you know, that the event in that community. Um, and so those discussions are ongoing. I hope to have an update uh, next week on the progress of, of that discussion. Um, in addition, we have placed uh, two Abbott ID machines at Huron Regional Medical Center um, for individuals to be tested as needed. Um, and we are currently working with another provider in that community to place an Abbott ID machine to have availability on, on a temporary basis. Next question. Okay, no, uh, all right, if I could follow up quickly, is that in addition to the Abbott ID that was already there, or is that too including the one that was there previously? Um, the two at Huron Regional Medical Center had been placed there previously when the community of okay. Huron experiencing issues. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next question. This is Jonathan with the Argus Theater. With the Argus Theater. We'll go to Jonathan. Sorry, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Hey, two quick questions. Um, looking at the age distribution, uh, number of cases in their 20s, I'm curious, Dr. Clayton, what you think the driving factor is there. And then secondly, you know, you're an epidemiologist who wrote about childhood influenza, and I'm curious what you think has been sort of the most interesting or remarkable uh, thing that you've noticed uh, about this pandemic. So, um, yeah, so the uh, first part of your question was, uh, uh, each, the, the, oh, the age group. So, yeah, I, yeah. I think um, you know when we're when we're looking at those that are uh, you know zero to nineteen years, uh, and, and even you know into that young adult years, uh, a lot of I think their exposures are driven by um, you know activities in the community, uh, associating with uh, you know other kids uh, you know their age and so on, and, and being part of friend groups. Um, you know. It, it will be, um, you know, very telling to kind of see uh, what what uh, happens over time with that population. But I know that in other states, we have seen that, especially that young adult group, has really um, been one that has felt that they are not at higher risk uh, for severe disease. Um, so they have, you know, been, uh, you know, uh, congregating together, uh, parties together, uh, and that any time that we are bringing groups of individuals together, that does raise the uh, you know the risk for uh, COVID-19 transmission, and so I, I think even even when we're talking about you know smaller groups of of 20 or 30, um, you know that those are individuals who have uh, uh, different experiences throughout the community, and uh, you know some of them may be at higher risk uh, due to uh, you know work, uh, uh, you know, being uh, around uh, other individuals, uh, you know traveling and so on. So you bring just a, a wide variety. Uh, of people uh, with different uh, exposure backgrounds together uh, that, that can potentially um, increase risk of transmission. The second question really around, um, you know, what has been kind of most interesting and, and you know, my background, uh, as you alluded to, uh, has, was publishing um, information uh, from my, my uh, uh, PhD dissertation around, uh, you know, childhood uh, vaccination and influenza and, uh, and really, I think the the big thing uh, for me is just you know we uh, we know that there are uh, negative consequences uh, you know when individuals become sick with other childhood vaccinations and and one of the most uh, you know pertinent is, is influenza because that's a threat that we uh, see every year uh, you know with uh, COVID-19 one of the things that has been interesting is it's not just been uh, the risk of uh, disease and uh, you know hospitalization and, and uh, potential risk for death among that uh, youth population, uh, which are uh, uh, which is actually lower, uh, you know, than uh, a lot of our other diseases uh, that that kill children serve as one of the primary uh, transmission uh, uh, nodes for. 
Um, but the other piece of it is that uh, this uh, multi-inflammatory syndrome among children uh, is just an interesting uh, uh, and unfortunate sequelae of uh, COVID-19 infection. And so, you know, seeing how that has impacted uh, uh, a small uh, group of children uh, is, is a very unfortunate uh, outcome uh, that can happen uh, with COVID-19 infection. So, uh, you know, I, 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 the, the risk is not zero for uh, children who are, are being exposed and becoming uh, ill with COVID-19. Next question. This is Lisa with the Argus Leader. Go ahead, Lisa. Um, are you planning for uh, any sort of surge that has happened in other states in recent weeks? So, uh, Lisa, this is Kim. Yeah, um, we are definitely, um, you know, actively watching our case counts um, and ensuring that we have staff um, needed to be able to conduct investigations in a timely manner as well as notify close contacts. Uh, we are also um, actively working, um, you know, with uh, any positive, when, when we see any positive cases in certain settings such as long-term care facilities, we to do that. Um, and, um, you know, we anticipate, um, you know, as we see uh, people uh, re-engaging in, in activities um, that we will see more COVID cases and we are prepared to uh, do the testing, the investigations, and the contact tracing necessary to, to minimize those exposures. Next question. Morgan. This is Stephen record. Groves from the AP. Go to Morgan and then Stephen. Thanks. Um, our reporter, who has been in Sturgis all week, noticed that there's this tent or booth where a marketing company is selling antibody tests, and they're not medical professionals or licensed in any way to be doing this and also aren't wearing their masks. Um, does the Department of Health advise against this kind of practice, and should people trust their results from there? What guidelines are there for people to um, just administer antibody tests in the state without the license? Morgan, I'll, I'll just start, and then Dr. Clayton can... Um, uh, weigh in as well. Um, again, I'll just reiterate, we talked about this on Monday, but um, the state of South Dakota does not regulate um, uh, testing machines that is done at the federal level. Um, if I were a consumer, I would be um, inquisitive about um, the experience that anybody that's offering a, a COVID test or any other medical test um, really has and the credentials that they have um, to um, accurately interpret any of those tests. Uh, remember, and you all uh, know this, I hope by now, but antibody tests um, detect uh, prior uh, potential infection of a disease, and so it's not uh, not used to diagnose a current infection. And so I'd be very curious about anybody that's um, peddling an antibody test about how uh, transparent they are being with what the results really tell you about those tests. Uh, and this is Dr. Clayton. I think the, the two points that I wanted to make is just that, you know, first, what, uh, you know, anytime an individual is undergoing, uh, you know, I will say a medical procedure as uh, you know, even, even something as uh, simple uh, as a nasal specimen might be, um, you know, or antibody testing, you know, uh, drawing of blood uh, in order to do those uh, antibody tests. Um, you know, that's something where you want to make sure that those uh, healthcare professionals uh, are trained in taking those appropriate precautions. Um, and so, you know, making sure that they're wearing, uh, you know, a, a mask, uh, gown, gloves, um, so that they're not only protecting you, they're protecting themselves as they uh, conduct that uh, specimen collection. Uh, the second uh, that I would mention is just, uh, you know, as Secretary Malsom raised and uh, said that, you know, they antibody there you know are have different uh, uh, levels of quality uh, to them and uh, you know we know that uh, there have been uh, other uh, tests that are not uh, have not received FDA approval and so uh, and they're under that emergency use authorization and so you know I, that would be one of the first questions that I would ask uh, because there have been uh, you know kind of Fly, those fly-by-night antibody tests uh, from outside of the st uh, outside of the, the country, uh, and you know you might be paying for uh, what essentially amounts uh, a, what amounts to a coin flip uh, with some of those um, you know poor quality uh, tests. And so I, I, I can't speak specifically uh, because I'm, I'm not aware of uh, what testing platform is being used uh, by some of those uh, testing sites, but that is a, a consideration that people should have. 
If I could follow up really quick, is this something that the Department of Health would have the jurisdiction to like shut them down or like investigate this in any way or inspect it? I don't know. So, uh, no, the, the, the uh, uh, Department of Health, uh, you know, individuals can uh, you know, receive uh, medical care uh, from uh, a lot of different avenues. And so that does include uh, individuals who might be uh, uh, receiving that uh, directed uh, point of care uh, antibody testing, you know, at, uh, uh, at other locations, uh, you know, whether it be a, from a trusted resource such as a, a clinic or a hospital in the community um, or from uh, outside medical entities uh, who are using uh, questionable tests. Right, but, but as, a, as a rule or as a, a generalization, I guess I should say, um, testing is not something that's regulated at the state level. Thanks. Now we'll go to Stephen with the AAP. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, you know, the governor had compared uh, deaths from COVID-19 to uh, deaths from accidents over the weekend, I think. And I was curious, uh, what uh, deaths from accidents are covered um, underneath that comparison? Um, is it automobile accidents? Um, and what other types of deaths are, are included in that category? So, Stephen, I think the reference was to injuries and accidents in a, in a general way, and that does include, um, you know, a number of different kinds of accidental injuries that do lead to death. Um, and unfortunately, in South Dakota, we do see um, many people dying from accidental injuries. Um, and um, over the last five months, those numbers have been higher than what we've seen for deaths from COVID. Uh, and so, uh, to speak specifically to uh, the different types of in, uh, injuries that, that uh, may result in death, uh, so the top five uh, for the past several months have been uh, falls, uh, motor vehicle accidents, uh, um, accidental uh, poisoning, and so that might be um, you know, due to uh, any number of things. It doesn't include just uh, you know, drug overdoses. Um, but it could be something as simple as a, a Tylenol overdose. Um, accidents um, due to uh, exposure to uh, uh, smoke, fire, flames. Um, so these individuals who uh, die in fires. Um, and then, uh, well, yeah, that, was, that, would, that would round out the, the top four. The fifth is kind of this unspecified um, uh, threat to breathing, which is uh, you know, uh, individuals that uh, um, may have uh, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning or, or other uh, things like that where they're, they're just not able to uh, get enough oxygen. And so, you know, unfortunate mm -hmm. carbon monoxide poisoning or other uh, uh, overwhelming gases and so on. Next question. And just can I follow up just so that I'm clear, that's actual people that died from those accidents or those injuries. So with the, the governor's number, more people have died, actually. Correct. Next question. All right, Todd Epp, Kello.com News. Go ahead, Todd. Thanks. Um, received information from the American Healthcare Association and the National Center for Assisted Living, and uh, they say the Centers for Amer uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services announced on July 22nd that CMS will begin requiring rather than recommending that all nursing homes in states with a 5% positivity rate or greater test all nursing home staff each week. And then they listed statistics from John Hopkins University as of Jul July 26 that had South Dakota within that 5% uh, range. That was 33 states, including South Dakota. Uh, is that something that the state is currently requiring is, or is our uh, positive, seven day positive testing rate now lower than uh, 5%? Um, Todd, this is Kim. So you can find our rate of positives on the dashboard and so that is, that is updated regularly. Um, to your question around um, the requirement from CMS for nursing homes to conduct testing of staff, uh, we are still waiting for the guidance from CMS about um, some of the, the, the ways that that um, will be conducted. And um, as you might recall, CMS is in the process of allocating uh, quick test uh, testing machines to each nursing home 
um, in the country. And so um, I think that there will be some delay in implementing uh, that requirement from CMS until there is uh, more testing capability within nursing homes um, in really across the country. Next okay, question. thank you. Welcome. Lee, Lee with SDPB. Go ahead, Lee. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, sort of testing capacity uh, for, um, you know, asymptomatic South Dakotans and, you know, uh, folks who might uh, be not from Sturgis but have worked up at the rally or folks not from Huron who are working at the um, state fair. Um, I know that Minnesota when there were the protests going on, anyone who was involved in some of those larger crowds were able to get a test. Um, asymptomatic people in California are able to get a test. Um, and, and I guess why, why aren't um, South Dakotans uh, who are asymptomatic able to yet? So Lee, I'll, I'm going to hit on one part of your question and then um, turn it over to Dr. Clayton for the, the broader issue of testing people that are asymptomatic. Um, the city of Sturgis um, will be offering mass testing to individuals um, after the Sturgis rally, um, and that will obviously include people that are asymptomatic, and that's who that is geared towards. Um, and so um, that is, is their plan and will be a, a good resource, I think, for people in that community. In our discussions with the medical community of Huron, uh, again, that is intended for uh, folks um, that have worked the fair who would be asymptomatic or worked, you know, in other industries or co otherwise come into contact with, you know, larger numbers of people because of the fair. We are also working on a plan to make testing available for uh, folks that live outside of the Huron area but who also um, either volunteer or participate in the fair. So that is definitely part of uh, the discussions and the planning that we're having. Uh, and then specifically around, uh, you know, the ability to test individuals uh, who are asymptomatic. And so, you know, uh, the, the first push, you know, was really to make sure that we had, um, and, and, you know, that would not include just South Dakota, but that would include all states uh, in the U.S., to have enough capacity to test individuals who were symptomatic uh, with COVID-19 symptoms uh, so that they could uh, get tested. Um, so, you know, we have uh, seen that and we have been able to kind of reach that uh, level of uh, support of testing uh, in state as well, uh, and with uh, the ability of testing individuals at uh, outside reference laboratories, uh, you know, the capacity is there. Um, the uh, focus of testing asymptomatic individuals, so the Department of Health does have a recommendation uh, to test individuals who are considered asymptomatic close contacts to a COVID-19 case. Uh, and so that is our uh, way of uh, prioritizing, uh, you know, first and foremost, symptomatic individuals, and secondary to that, uh, asymptomatic individuals with that, con with the, that close contact. Um, the, the larger testing of asymptomatic individuals, uh, you know, I would, uh, that's not currently a recommendation from, uh, from the Department of Health. Um, but that's, uh, you know, something that in speaking with uh, your uh, medical provider, uh, you know, you, uh, you could uh, have that discussion. Uh, my one uh, concern slash reservation around doing so is, you know, we have seen that uh, testing volumes uh, you know, have increased uh, nationally, uh, and some of that has meant, uh, has led to uh, delays in getting those test results. And that time to getting those test results is a very important part of our ability to respond. Uh, because if we're not hearing uh, of, and learning of an individual who is uh, a positive case until seven to 10 days after their specimen was collected, um, you know, that, that is problematic. And so we want to make sure that we have uh, the capacity to, to uh, identify uh, those who are considered priority, um, which is focusing on symptomatic individuals and asymptomatic individuals who are close contact. Um, I would just maybe provide one update that we received this morning from uh, HHS at the federal level. And um, I think, again, we've talked about the fact that those testing turnaround times for those large commercial labs has been an issue um, across the country and one that HHS has really prioritized to work on. Uh, they reported this morning that the average turnaround time is three days or less. So that is good news in that front. But to Dr. Clayton's point, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're testing appropriately and, um, you know, paying attention to those turnaround times. 
Good time for one final so question. If I could follow up, if no one else has a question. Um, Go ahead, Lee. This, so, the, so the state, uh, is it the state that doesn't have the ability to turn around those uh, tests quick enough, or is it is it larger than that? No, the state turns around. Um, the state public health lab um, has consistently uh, been able to provide results um, within 24 hours, sometimes up to 48 hours. And then the other labs within the state of South Dakota, we just talked with our partners um, this week, and they are able to keep up uh, within a 48-hour turnaround time as well. So that is good news um, for labs in the state of South Dakota. Hi, Ray from Kelland, if I can have one last question. Sure, Ray. Hi. Yeah, just to follow up on that, because um, you're working with the, the city of Huron and the city of Sturgis, um, there was a couple large events in this the Sioux Falls, eastern South Dakota area, namely Sioux Empire Fair, um, and then a few rodeos. Would you recommend at this point that um, cities or communities consider when there's those large events, you know, trying to arrange for some mass testing of whether it's workers or volunteers? Ray, I guess I would start by saying I, I do think that's a, a, an event-specific uh, kind of question, and um, you know, there there are some some things that you want to consider about how effective uh, some of that testing would be, um, depending on the event and uh, the community in, in which those events are actually held. And so, I'd look to Dr. Clayton to maybe set in some details that way. Yeah, I mean, so one of the um, recommendations. Uh, you know, from CDC is really uh, when you're having, uh, you know, mass uh, larger events or, or uh, mass gatherings um, that, you know, if you're having, identifying individuals uh, who are infected with, uh, that have attended that event, um, that it, it is, uh, uh, you know, recommended uh, to uh, consider, you know, uh, testing uh, at a larger scale. And so, um, you know, the, the focus there would then be um, you know, how do you uh, work to uh, create that uh, capabil capability to do all this, the uh, collection and, and uh, specimen support and testing. Um, but, you know, I think that uh, should be a consideration that uh, any uh, event is having, uh, especially if it is a larger event, um, that there can be impacts on the, the surrounding community um, from that event and, uh, you know, want to think about how to partner with uh, individuals to keep their staff safe um, as well as to keep uh, any participants 